Hey everyone. So I um, have decided that this is going to be our last reading of Crime and Punishment. We're just about 20% of the way into the book. I'm going to take you through uh, to the end of chapter one in part two of the book. Um, and you can go on to read it yourself. This is the new uh, 2014 Penguin edition with the Oliver Reddy trans uh, translation. And we are at the point in the book where he has done the crime and he's being asked to report to the police station. He's not sure why. It's a trick. They want to lure me in, then trip me up, he went on to himself, walking out onto the landing. Too bad I'm almost raving. I might come out with something stupid. On the stairs, he remembered. He left all the items where they were, in the hole, in the wallpaper. Now, when I'm out, would be just the time for a search, remembered and stopped. But he was suddenly overwhelmed by such despair, by what one can only call the cynicism of doom that he dismissed the thought and carried on. The sooner the better. Outside, it was unbearable. Hot. All these days and not a drop of rain. Again, the dust, bricks, and mortar. Again, the stink from the shops and drinking dens. Again, the drunks at every corner, the Finnish peddlers, the decrepit cabs. The sun shone brightly into his eyes to the point that it became painful to look and his head spun round and round as usually happens when you suddenly step outside with a fever on a bright sunny day. Reaching the turn to yesterday's street, he glanced down it at that house with excruciating anxiety and immediately looked away. If they ask, I might just tell them, he thought, approaching the bureau. It was a few hundred yards from where he lived to the bureau. It had just moved to new premises, a new building, the fourth floor. He'd passed by the old premises once, but a long time ago now. Going under the arch, he noticed stairs on his right and a man walking down with a book in his hands. Must be the caretaker, so the bureau must be here. And he started climbing up, following his nose. He was in no mood to ask anyone about anything. I'll go in, fall to my knees, and tell them everything, he thought, on reaching the fourth floor. It was a tight, steep staircase covered in slops. All the kitchens of all the apartments on all four floors opened onto these stairs and stayed open nearly all day long. That was why it was so terribly stuffy. Up and down the stairs went caretakers with registers tucked under their arms, police errand boys, and assorted men and women, the visitors. The door to the bureau itself was also wide open. He went in and stopped in the anteroom. Some peasant types were standing around waiting. It was exceptionally stuffy here too, not to mention the nauseatingly strong smell from the freshly coated walls, damp paint made with rancid oil. After waiting a short while, he decided to press on to the next room. They were all so tiny and low. A terrible impatience drew him on. No one noticed him. Some clerks, a strange looking lot, dressed only marginally better than he was, were sat writing in the second room. He turned to one of them. Well? He presented the summons from the bureau. You're a student, the man asked, glancing at the summons. Yes, a former student. The clerk looked him over, though without the faintest curiosity. He was a particularly unkempt individual with something obsessive in his gaze. You won't learn anything from him. He doesn't give a damn, thought Raskolnikov. Go and see the head clerk, said the unkempt man, jabbing his finger in the direction of the very last room. He entered this room, the fourth, which was cramped and filled to bursting with a somewhat smarter crowd than the others. Among the visitors were two ladies. One dressed in humble morning clothes was sitting at a table opposite the head clerk who was dictating something to her. The other lady, a very plump, crimson, blotchy, striking woman, dressed rather too lavishly with a brooch on her chest the size of a saucer, was standing to one side, waiting for something. Raskolnikov thrust his summons at the head clerk, who took one glance at it, told him to wait, and turned back to the lady in mourning. He could breathe more freely. Must be something else. Little by little, he began to cheer up, exhorting himself as best he could to pull himself together. 
say something stupid or even just a tiny bit careless and you'll give yourself away completely. Hmm, shame there's no air in here, he added, so stuffy, my head's spinning even more, and my mind, too. Everything inside him was at sixes and sevens. He feared losing control. He tried to find something to hold on to, something to think about, something totally irrelevant, but without any success. The head clerk intrigued him greatly, though. He kept scanning his face for signs, for clues to his character. He was very young, 22 or so, with swarthy, mobile features that made him look older than his years, foppishly dressed, his hair parted at the back, combed and pomaded, with a great number of jewels and rings on white brush-scrubbed fingers and gold chains on his waistcoat. He even exchanged a few words in French, very competently, too, with a foreigner who happened to be in the room. Louisa Ivanovna, won't you sit down, he said in passing to the overdressed crimson lady who was still standing as if she dared not sit, though there was a chair right beside her. Ich danke, she said, and with a rustle of silk, lowered herself quietly into the chair. Her light blue dress with white lace trimmings spread out around the chair like an air balloon taking up nearly half the room. There was a whiff of perfume but the lady was clearly embarrassed to be taking up half the room and to be filling it with her scent, though she was smiling too timidly and insolently at one and the same time, albeit with evident anxiety. The lady in mourning finally finished and started getting up, suddenly somewhat noisily rolling his shoulders at each step in a very dashing, rather emphatic way. An officer walked in, flung his service cap down on the table and sat down in an armchair, the lavish lady all but leapt from her seat on seeing him and set about curtsying with particular enthusiasm. But the officer didn't pay her the slightest attention and she dared not sit down again in his presence. He was a lieutenant, assistant to the superintendent, with a ginger mustache that stuck out horizontally on both sides and exceptionally small features that failed to express anything much other than a certain insolence. He looked askance and with some indignation at Raskolnikov, his clothes were too shabby for words, but his bearing was somehow at odds with them for all his abjection. Raskolnikov, in his recklessness, had stared at the lieutenant so long and so hard, he'd even managed to offend him. Well then, shouted the lieutenant, probably amazed that this tramp had no intention of vaporizing beneath his fiery gaze. An order, a summons. Raskolnikov half replied. It's about that claim for some money from the student, I mean, the head clerk threw out, lifting his head from his papers. There you go, sir. He tossed Raskolnikov a notebook after pointing to the right place. Read it. Money? What money? Thought Raskolnikov. But that means it definitely can't be that. And he shuddered with joy. He suddenly felt dreadfully, inexpressibly relieved. Everything simply fell from his shoulders. And when were you told to come, gracious sir, shouted the lieutenant, who for some reason was taking ever greater offense. Nine o'clock is what's written, and now it's gone eleven. It was only delivered a quarter of an hour ago, Raskolnikov replied loudly over his shoulder, suddenly getting angry as well, to his own surprise, and even taking a certain pleasure in the fact. It's enough that I'm here at all with a fever like mine. No need to shout. I'm not shouting, I'm speaking perfectly calmly. You're the one shouting, but I am a student and I will not allow myself to be shouted at. The assistant was so incensed that at first he couldn't even speak and merely sputtered and spat. He leapt from his seat. Kindly hold your tongue, sir. You're on state premises. Watch your step, I say. You too are on state premises, shrieked Raskolnikov. And not only are you shouting, you are also smoking, thereby showing us all a distinct lack of respect. Saying this, Raskolnikov experienced inexpressible pleasure. The head clerk smiled at them. The fiery lieutenant was visibly flustered. None of your business, sir, he yelled at last, more loudly than was natural. Now kindly supply the statement demanded of you. Show him, Alexander Grigorievich. We've received a complaint about you for not paying up. You've got some pluck. I'll give you that. But Raskolnikov was no longer listening and greedily snatched the document, desperate to see what it was all about. He read it once, twice, 
and still didn't understand. What is it? He asked the head clerk. A demand for payment on a promissory note, a recovery claim. Either you pay up, including all the costs, fines, and so on, or you submit a statement in writing saying when you will be able to pay and undertaking not to leave the capital until that time and not to sell or conceal your property. The creditor, meanwhile, is free to sell your property and to deal with you in accordance with the law. But I don't owe anyone. That's none of our business. What concerns us is the legitimate claim we have received for overdue payment on a promissory note made out for 115 rubles issued by yourself to the collegiate assessor's widow, Zarnitsina, nine months ago, and transferred as payment to court counselor Chibarov. Hence, we are inviting you to make a statement. But she's my landlady. And what if she is? The head clerk looked at him with a patronizing smile of pity, mixed with a note of triumph, as if Raskolnikov were a raw recruit coming under fire for the first time. Now how do you feel, he seemed to be saying. But how could any of this, promissory notes, recovery claims, matter to him now? Did it really warrant the faintest anxiety, or even a moment's attention? He stood, read, listened, replied, even asked questions himself, but he did so mechanically. The triumph of survival, of deliverance from oppressive danger. This was what filled his entire being at that moment. No predictions or analysis, no speculations or deductions, no doubts or questions. It was a moment of complete, spontaneous, purely animal joy. But at this very same moment, something like thunder and lightning erupted in the bureau. The lieutenant, still badly shaken by such shocking familiarity, ablaze with indignation, and clearly desperate to avenge his wounded vanity, was now directing all his thunderbolts at the unfortunate lavish lady who'd been looking at him ever since he walked in with a perfectly stupid smile. And you, Mrs. Whatnot, he suddenly yelled at the top of his voice. The lady in mourning had already left. What was all that about over at yours last night, eh? Bringing shame on the whole street again? More debauchery, more fights, more drunkenness. Suppose you fancy a stint in a house of correction. Ten times I've told you, Mrs. Whatnot. Ten times I've warned you that the 11th will be one too many. And here you are, all over again. The document fell from Raskolnikov's hands and he stared wildly at the lavish lady who was being told off so unceremoniously. But he soon grasped what it was all about and immediately began to find the whole business most entertaining. He listened with such pleasure that he wanted to roar and roar with laughter. His nerves were all tingling inside him. Ilya Petrovich, the head clerk began solicitously before deciding to bide his time. There was no way of restraining the lieutenant once his blood was up other than by force, as he knew from his own experience. As for the lavish lady, at first she simply quivered from the force of the thunder and lightning. But strangely enough, the more frequent and the more abusive the insults became, the more courteous she seemed and the more charmingly she smiled at the menacing lieutenant. She danced from foot to foot, dropping one curtsy after another and impatiently waiting for the moment when she too would be allowed to have her say, it finally came. There was no noise and no fighting in my house, Herr Kapitan, she suddenly rapped out, scattering her words like peas in boisterous Russian, albeit with a heavy German accent. Und there was no scandal. Und he come back to house drunken. Und I tell you everything, Herr Kapitan. Und I not guilty. I have honorable house, Herr Kapitan, and honorable behavior, Herr Kapitan. And always, always, no scandal want. Und he come back very drunken. Und he three more puddles ask for. Und then he lifted one leg and begin play piano with foot. Und this very bad in honorable house, and he break piano, and this very, very vulgar, and I say so. Then he pottle take and begin pushing everyone behind the pottle, and I begin call the caretaker, and Carl come. 
he take Carl and Black Eye give him and Genriet too and my cheek hit five times. This is so rude in honorable house, Herr Capitan. And I begin shout. Then he open window to ditch and begin squeal in window like small pig. What disgrace, Herr Capitan? Squeal, squeal, squeal like little pig. What disgrace? Fu fu fu! And Carl grab him behind mit tails and take him from window. And then, this is true, Herr Capitan, he tears sein tailcoat. And then he shouts that Carl must 15 rubles fine pay. And I myself, Herr Capitan, him five rubles for sein tailcoat pay. And he dishonorable cast, Herr Capitan, and great scandal making. I will have big satire in all the papers about you gedrukt, he say. A scribbler, I suppose. Yes, Herr Capitan, and such dishonorable guest, Herr Capitan, in such honorable house. All right, all right, enough. If I've told you once, I've told you. Ilya Petrovich, said the head clerk again with meaning. The lieutenant glanced in his direction, and the head clerk gave the faintest of nods. So here's what I'll say to you, most esteemed Lavisa Ivanovna. And I'm saying it for the very last time the lieutenant went on. One more scandal in your honorable house, and I'll have your guts for garters, as Z poets say. Got it? So you say a scribbler, a writer, earned five rubles in an honorable house for a coattail. A fine lot, these writers, he exclaimed with a contemptuous glance at Raskolnikov. There was another scene in a tavern a couple of days ago. He'd eaten but didn't want to pay. I'll write you up in a satire instead, he said. Then there was that chap on a steamer last week who heaped the vilest abuse on the respected family of a state councillor, his wife and daughter, and another who recently got himself chucked out of a pastry shop. That's what they're like, these writers, scribblers, students, town criers. Ugh. Well, clear off then. I'll be paying you a visit myself, so watch your step. Got it? With precipitate civility, Louisa Ivanovna set about curtsying in all directions and curtsied her way back to the door. But in the doorway, still walking backwards, she bumped into a rather striking officer with a fresh open face and quite magnificent thick blonde whiskers. This was Nikodim Fomich himself, the district superintendent. Louisa Ivanovna hastily curtsied almost to the floor and flew out of the bureau with quick mincing bouncing steps. Making racket again, more thunder and lightning, a tornado, a hurricane, remarked Nikodim Fomich to Ilya Petrovich in an ami amiable, friendly way. I see they've got you all worked up again, boiling over again. I could hear you from the stairs. Come off it, said Ilya Petrovich, with well-bred nonchalance, and not so much off it as orf it taking some documents or other over to another table and lifting his shoulders theatrically with each step. Please judge for yourself. Mr. Writer here, or should I say Mr. Student, or rather former student, won't pay having written out one promissory note after another. Won't vacate the apartment. Is the subject of endless complaints, yet still has the temerity to rebuke me for lighting a papyrosa in his presence. His behavior is simply disgraceful, and anyway, just take a look at him. A fine specimen. Poverty is no sin, my friend, but why all the fuss? You're a powder keg, as everyone knows, and you can't take an insult. I expect he insulted you first, so you lashed out. Nikodim Fomich went on, courteously addressing Raskolnikov. But you really shouldn't have done. He's the noblest of men, let me assure you, the noblest, but he's gunpowder. Flares up, sizzles away, burns out, and that's that. Finished. And all that's left is the gold in his heart. Lieutenant Powder Keg, that's what they called him in the regiment. And what a regiment that was, exclaimed Ilya Petrovich, delighted at being so agreeably tickled, though still in a huff. Raskolnikov had a sudden urge to say something exceptionally nice to them all. Have a heart, Captain, he began very freely, turning all of a sudden to Nikodim Fomich, and put yourself in my shoes for a moment. I'm even prepared to offer him an apology, if I've shown a lack of respect. I'm a poor, sick student. 
dejected, that was his exact word, dejected by poverty. I'm a former student because I can't support myself at the moment, but I am expecting some money. My mother and sister live in province. They're sending me some and I'll pay. My landlady's a kind one more months in a row, but she won't even send up meals. And as for the promissory note, I haven't a clue what you mean. She's waving that IOU at me, but what can I pay her with? Judge for yourselves. But that's none of our business, the head clerk tried to put in again. Quite so, I couldn't agree more, but kindly allow me to put my side judge for yourselves. But that's none of our business, the head clerk tried to put in again. Quite so, I couldn't agree more, but kindly allow me pretense boring him. For my part, that I've been living at hers for about three years now, ever since I arrived from the province and before, before, well, why don't I just admit it? You see, I gave her my word right from the start that I'd marry her daughter. A verbal promise, freely undertaken. This girl was, well, I even took a fancy to her, though I wasn't in love with her. Youth, in a word. What I mean is my landlady lent me plenty of money at the time, and the life I led was, to a certain extent, well, I was very frivolous. No one's asking you for such intimacies, sir, and there's no time for them anyway, Ilya Petrovich interrupted, rudely and gloatingly. But Raskolnikov rushed to cut him short, even though he was suddenly finding him, finding it terribly difficult to speak. But kindly allow me, if you would, to tell the whole story, to explain how it was. For my part, though it's quite unnecessary, I agree. But a year ago, this young girl died of typhus while I stayed on as a lodger. And the landlady, when she'd moved into the apartment she has now, said to me in a friendly way that she had every confidence in me and so on and so on. But wouldn't I like to write for her a promissory note for 115 rubles, which according to her sums was what I owed her. Take note, sir. She specifically said that just as soon as I gave her that document, she'd once again lend me as much as I wanted, and that never, never for her part, these were her exact words, would she take advantage of this document until I paid up myself. And now, just when I have lost my teaching and have nothing to eat, she goes in as a recovery claim? So what can I say? All these sentimental de details, honorable sir, do not concern us, Ilya Petrovich insolently broke in. You must supply a statement and an undertaking. And as for being in love and all these tragic particulars, well, we could not care less. Well, really, that's a bit harsh, muttered Nikodim Fomich, sitting down to sign some papers as well. He felt almost ashamed. Go on, write, the head clerk told Raskolnikov. Write what? asked the latter in a particularly rude sort of way. I'll dictate. It seemed to Raskolnikov that the head clerk had become more casual and scornful towards him after his confession. But strangely enough, he suddenly felt utterly indifferent to anyone else's opinion. And this change had come about just like that, in a flash. Had he chosen to pause for a moment's thought, then he would have, of course, have been amazed. How could he have spoken to them like that just a moment ago and even thrust his feelings upon them? And where had they come from, these feelings? Now, on the contrary, if the room had suddenly filled up, not with police officers, but with his bosom friends, even then, it seemed, he could have found no human words for them. So empty had his heart suddenly become. A gloomy sensation of excruciating, endless solitude and estrangement suddenly communicated itself consciously to his soul. His abject effusions before Ilya Petrovich, lieutenant's abject gloating. It was not these that had suddenly turned his heart inside out. Oh, what did any of it matter to him now? His own despicable behavior, all this vanity. These lieutenants, German ladies, recovery claims, bureaus, etc., etc. Had he been sentenced to the stake at this moment, even then he would not have stirred. Even then he would scarcely have bothered listening to the sentence. 
Something entirely unfamiliar was happening to him. Something new, sudden, and completely unprecedented. He did not so much understand as sense with the full force and clarity of his senses that he no longer had anything to say to these people in the local police bureau. Never mind exhibitions of sentiment. And had they all been his very own brothers and sisters and not district lieutenants, even then there would have been no point talking to them whatever life threw in his path. Never before had he experienced such a strange and dreadful sensation. And the most excruciating thing of all was that this was more a sensation than something conscious, something intellectual, a direct sensation, the most excruciating of all sensations experienced by him hitherto in his life. The head clerk began dictating the statement following the usual form in such cases, i.e., unable to pay, promise to do such and such, a date, whenever, shan't leave town, shan't sell or give away my property, etc. But you can't even write. You keep dropping the pen, the head clerk observed, peering curiously at Raskolnikov. Are you sick? Yes, heads spinning. Carry on. That's it. Now sign. The head clerk took the document and turned to the other people waiting. Raskolnikov gave back the pen, but instead of getting up to leave, he placed his elbows on the desk and gripped his head in his hands, as if a nail were being knocked into the crown of his head. A strange notion suddenly struck him to get up right now walk over to Nicodem Fomich and tell him all about yesterday, down to the very last detail, then go with them to his apartment and show them the items in the corner in the hole. The urge was so strong that he was already on his feet to carry it out. Perhaps I should think about it first, flashed across his mind. No, best not to think and get it over and done with. But suddenly... He stopped dead in his tracks. Nikodim Fomich was having a heated exchange with Ilya Petrovich and their words carried over to him. Impossible. They'll release the pair of them. First off, it makes no sense. Why would they call the caretaker if it was their doing? To inform against themselves? Or were they just being clever? No, that would be too clever by half. And anyway, Pestryakov, the student, was seen right at the gates by both caretakers and the tradeswoman. At the very moment he walked in, he had three friends with him and he left them at the gates and asked the caretakers about accommodation while his friends were still there. You tell me, would he have started asking about accommodation if those were his intentions? And as for Coke, before calling on the old woman, he kept the silversmith company for half an hour downstairs, then went up to see her at a quarter to eight sharp. Think about it. But wait, isn't there a glaring contradiction here? They say they knocked and the door was locked. Then three minutes later, when they came back with the caretaker, it turns out to be open. That's just it. The killer was inside, no doubt about it, and had locked himself in. And they would have caught him, no doubt about it, if Coke hadn't stupidly run off to get the caretaker. And it was precisely then, during that brief interval, that he managed to go down the stairs and somehow slip past them. Coke crosses himself with one hand, then the other, and says, if I'd stayed put, he'd have leapt out and killed me with the axe. Now he wants to hold a Thanksgiving service in the Russian fashion. (laughs) So no one saw the killer? How could they? It's like Noah's Ark, that house, the head clerk observed, listening in from his desk. It's all as clear as day. Clear as day, Nikodim Fomich excitedly repeated. Clear as mud, snapped Ilya Petrovich. Raskolnikov picked up his hat and made for the door, but he didn't reach it. When he came to his senses, he saw that he was sitting on a chair, that there was someone supporting him to his right and someone else standing to his left, holding a yellow glass filled with yellow water. While Nikodim Fomich stood before him, staring at him, he got up from the chair. What is it? Are you sick? asked Nikodim Fomich rather abruptly. Even when he was signing his name, he could barely hold the pen, observed the head clerk, returning to his seat and busying himself with his papers again. Been sick long, Ilya Petrovich shouted from his desk as he too sorted through his papers. He, of course, had also been studying him after he fainted, but immediately moved off when he came round. 
Since yesterday, Raskolnikov muttered in reply. And did you go outside yesterday? Yes. Sick? Yes. What time? Evening, after seven. And where to, may I ask? Down the street. Clear and to the point. Raskolnikov, pale as a handkerchief, replied abruptly and curtly, meeting Ilya Petrovich's gaze with his black, swollen eyes. He can barely stand. And, and you, Nikodim Fomich began. Don't mind me, said Ilya Petrovich in a very particular tone. Nikodim Fomich was about to say something else, but taking one glance at the head clerk, who was also staring hard at him, he fell silent. Everyone suddenly fell silent. It was strange. Very well, sir, Ilya Petrovich concluded. We aren't keeping you. Raskolnikov left, but he could hear an animated conversation starting up once he'd gone with the quizzical voice of Nikodim Fomich, most audible of all. Outside, he came round fully. A search, a search. Now, now, he repeated to himself as he hurried along. They suspect me, the rascals. His old terror seized him once more from top to toe. All right. So that does conclude my reading of the first 21% of Fyodor Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. I hope that you will pick up the book and read the rest of it yourself. And I'll see you back here in our next installments to do something else another time. Take care.